Hello and welcome to this edition of World at War. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh. The war in Sudan, as strange as it may sound, has got nothing to do with the people of Sudan. The common people of Sudan are the victims of this war. The two military generals who are fighting for supremacy in Sudan have flouted every single ceasefire. Critical infrastructure has been targeted and life has been brought to a standstill. But the question is this. Who is arming these two military generals in Sudan? And why is it that Sudan that has just emerged out of one of Africa's longest and bloodiest civil wars that ended with the creation of South Sudan in 2011 has again plunged into another civil war in 2023? A ceasefire should result in a temporary suspension of fighting. But in Sudan, each ceasefire is being manipulated by the headbutting generals to gain some advantage. Resulting in greater violence on the streets, the Sudanese army is using heavy air power to bomb RSF positions in densely populated Khartoum. Thick plumes of smoke are visible from miles around. Almost every shop is shut. And with widespread shortage of essential supplies, there are reports of shops, supermarkets and even banks being looted. Fuel stations are running dry. Most neighborhoods have been without power for days. Sudanese people caught up in this fighting are being forced to make a difficult choice, either to stay on and hope that the fighting ends soon, or flee from their homes to a safer place. We were forced to come here because of the fighting in Khartoum. We had to run as quickly as possible because of the war. It was a difficult journey. We wanted to stay with our relatives here because we have suffered a lot. More than 100,000 people have fled from Sudan in the last 20 days. Over 350,000 are internally displaced. Regular checkpoints have been set up by both the Sudanese army and the RSF in areas where they control. People coming from Khartoum who are escaping the war and trying to find safety and security arrive here under very difficult circumstances. Some people who have passed through here don't have food, some are sick and some are very old. At Port Sudan, hundreds of families are camping at a makeshift center, hoping for a chance to board a plane or even a ship. Nobody could ever wish this upon anyone, not their enemies, not themselves. I hope everyone can eventually come back and all these problems are solved. Nobody really wants to leave their country. And that is why I hope things get better soon and everyone comes home. But when will the fighting end in Sudan? Not anytime soon, because both generals are being bucked and armed by powerful Western forces. The rebel paramilitary group called the RSF is being provided with surface-to-air missiles and other ammunition by the Wagner mercenary group. Libya's general Khalifa Haftar has thrown his weight too behind the RSF leader Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo. According to open source intelligence, Russia is pumping in weapons from its Syrian Latakia airbase into the Krib al Tom camp in Sudan. All this with stopovers at the Libyan air bases of Al Qadim and Al Jufra, which are currently under the control of Khalifa Haftar. General Abdel Fattah Al Burhan is friendly with Egypt. With the Nile River flowing from Sudan into Egypt, and with Ethiopia's ambitious Renaissance Dam being a major flashpoint in the region, Cairo has major stakes in shaping the developments that happen in Khartoum. South Sudan seceded from Sudan after a protracted civil war that raged on for over two decades in which an estimated two million people are said to have been killed. South Sudan took with it its rich oil fields, leaving Sudan poorer and dependent on agriculture and gold exports. The RSF General Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hemeti, has got into several marquee deals for the export of gold with mercenary groups such as Wagner. It is a combination of these factors that has pushed Sudan deep into another protracted civil war. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. 
This is the slogan of the National Rifle Association of America and a line that is parroted by those who wish to purchase and keep guns with them. But three incidents on two separate continents must drill some common sense into the pro-gun lobbies around the world. That without access to guns, it is not easy for people to kill other people. Now, Serbia this week has been rocked by unprecedented mass shootings. A 13-year-old boy who decided to pull the trigger on his classmates inside of his classroom. And a 21-year-old in Serbia again who drove around in his car shooting people at random. And in the United States of America, the nation that is notorious as the epicenter of civilian mass shootings, a man pulled the trigger on his neighbors just because he was told to stop shooting in his yard as that was disturbing the sleep of a one-month-old infant. What will it take for those who are addicted to buying and owning guns to realize that without easy access to guns, the bloodletting due to mass shootings will not happen? Eight students and a security guard were killed in a school shooting in Belgrade on the 3rd of May. The rare shooting occurred at 8.40 a.m. at an elementary school in Belgrade's downtown Pakrar district. The 13-year-old assailant, identified as Kosta Kachmanovic, himself called the police and was arrested in the schoolyard. In the meticulously planned attack in the works for a month, the teenager had drawn detailed maps of the classrooms and prepared a kill list of students he intended to shoot dead. Shocked by the carnage, the Serbian president labelled it as one of the most difficult days in recent Serbian history. This day is one of the most difficult in the modern history of our country. Serbia is unfortunately united in grief. This grief is so great that we do not remember a greater one. Mass shootings are extremely rare and an unheard of phenomenon in the Balkan nation, with no mass shootings reported at Serbian schools in recent years. But Serbia, like the United States, is awash with guns left over from the wars of the 1990s. Although purchasing a firearm requires a special permit in Serbia, the 13-year-old assailant was armed with two pistols, one in his backpack and the one that he used. Both the guns used in the shooting spree were owned by the assailant's father, who was also arrested later. Some media reports attributed bullying as a possible motive, but no conclusions have been made. I feel disappointed, and I have a lot of questions. Where are we as human beings? Where is our empathy? Where did we all fail to see the problem, both with the person who did this and with all the other people that have led this to happen? What for the last few decades had been rare in Serbia was repeated immediately the next day. A 21-year-old gunman, identified by his initials UB, armed with an automatic weapon, opened fire from a moving vehicle before fleeing. The shooting spree, in which at least eight people were killed and 14 wounded, spread across three separate villages near Mladenovac. The drive-by shooting suspect was arrested early on Friday after a night-long manhunt by hundreds of police. A nation scarred by wars but unaccustomed to mass shootings has now been thrust uncomfortably into the spotlight. In the United States, where mass shootings are rather alarmingly frequent, a seemingly banal interaction turned into yet another tragedy. On the 28th of April, in Houston, Texas, Francisco Oropesa, a 39-year-old Mexican national, was requested by his neighbors to stop shooting his semi-automatic rifle in his yard because the noise was keeping their baby awake. Infuriated at this innocuous request, 
he stormed the crowded house of his Honduran neighbors and shot five of them dead, execution style, including an eight-year-old child. He was later arrested after a massive four-day manhunt in a neighboring town. Separated by geography and modus operandi, these two incidents are similar in the way the assailants could easily access guns. Here's some food for thought. In a world where assault weapons are not so readily available, would we still witness such horrific attacks so frequently? One hundred forty-seven villages, including twenty-eight women and forty-five children, were massacred in Burkina Faso on the twentieth of April. The figure is more than twice the official figure of sixty deaths. Survivors, interestingly, have blamed the Burkina-Bay security forces for the carnage. The Burkina-Bay military government, though, has condemned the barbaric act and has urged for a full inquiry. Now, some are of the opinion that the terrorist attack in the Burkina-Bay army fatigues. Could have carried out the attack. One of the world's most volatile countries, Burkina Faso, has been battling Islamist insurgency for close to a decade. Now that a full and impartial inquiry is being called, the question is this: Will the perpetrators behind this gruesome massacre be brought to justice? In one of the worst attacks on civilians in the West African nation of Burkina Faso. 136 people were massacred in the northern village of Karma on the 20th of April. Armed men dressed in fatigues of the Burkinabis armed forces reportedly slaughtered the unsuspecting villagers in a carnage that lasted for more than six hours. Survivors of the massacre at a press conference about a week later blamed the Burkinaba security forces for the killing. On April 20th, around 7 a.m., I was at the well washing my clothes. We saw many motorcycles coming, followed by big trucks. Some people said we had to run away. I said that it was not necessary because they are our military and not jihadists. Their job is to investigate to find the jihadists and liberate our country. Indeed, the villagers welcomed them with respect and shouts of joy. The joy was short-lived as more than a hundred died in the ensuing carnage, including babies on the backs of their fleeing mothers. Babies died on the back of their executed mothers. The carnage lasted more than six hours before the soldiers left the village of Dinguiri. The survivors were able to leave after their departure, while some of the wounded were transported to the regional hospital of Waigoya by the survivors. Others could not be evacuated and succumbed to their injuries. Eleven more were killed the same day by assailants. Six in Dinguiri village, two in Mene, and three on the road between Uihuga and Barga. The toll is likely to climb higher, considering information is still awaited from some villages in the area. Especially noteworthy is the timing of the bloodbath that followed a jihadist attack on the 15th of April. That attack claimed the lives of 40 Burkinaba troops and volunteer auxiliaries in the same region. According to survivor accounts, the assailants suspected the Karma villagers of sheltering terrorists and hence the blowback. Burkinabi armed forces for close to a decade have been battling an Islamist insurgency by groups affiliated with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, who are believed to have infiltrated from neighboring Mali since 2015. More than 10,000 civilians and members of the security forces have been killed in the conflict since then. At least two million people have been internally displaced. The mounting toll precipitated two military coups last year, the most recent of which was on 30th of September, when 34-year-old Ibrahim Traore seized power. In one of the world's most impoverished countries, at least 40% of the country lies outside the government control. But is this heavy-handed and rash approach the rightful course of action to rein in members of terror groups and to recapture lost territory? The northeastern Indian state of Manipur has been rocked by terrible violent ethnic clashes this past week. Now more than a dozen people reportedly been killed in these clashes over a controversial government move. 
Curfew has also been imposed. Internet services have been suspended in a bid to curtail the widespread arson and anarchy. Thousands of people have been evacuated from the violence-affected areas. Now, sensing that the situation could actually spiral completely out of control, shoot at sight orders have also been issued. Our next report gets you the details as to what is happening in the Indian state of Manipur. Hundreds of military personnel were deployed to the remote northeastern Indian state of Manipur on the 4th of May. The military deployment to Manipur, which shares border with Myanmar, was after a protest march by tribal groups on the 3rd of May turned violent. The Tribal Solidarity March was called by the All Tribal Student Union Manipur or Atsum in the Churachanpur district of Manipur. These tribal groups, comprising mainly ethnic Naga and Kuki, were protesting against demands by the majority Meite community to be included under the government's scheduled tribe category. <laughs> Violent street clashes erupted between these ethnic communities soon thereafter and widespread arson was also reported. As a precautionary measure, internet services were suspended for five days statewide. Shoot at sight orders in extreme cases were given and dawn to dusk indefinite curfew imposed. Actually, uh, the main thing <clears throat> that we have uh, done after uh, yesterday, I mean from yesterday, is that uh, this orders which has come out uh, regarding, uh, uh, regarding the curfew 144 and also uh, shooting people who make trouble. Since the army is conducting the flag marches, uh, they do not, uh, like we said, uh, deal with people in a way the police deals. Uh, they are made to destroy the opponent uh, by using maximum force. As per Indian law, members of such tribes are given reserved quotas for government jobs and college admission. This quota system is a corrective measure of sorts to address structural inequality and discrimination spanning generations. The majority non-tribal Meite community, which dominates the Imphal Valley, is perceived by the tribals to be encroaching upon the constitutionally defined privileged status of tribals. Both Naga and Kuki tribes constitute about 40% of the 3.6 million state population. Manipuri Chief Minister N. Biren Singh appealed for peace and harmony, adding that previous lives had been lost in the clashes. My dear brother and sister in the state of Manipur. During the last around 24 hours, some incident of classes, vandalisms and arson have been reported in Imphal, Shoshanpur, Vishnupur, Kangkokpi and More, etc. Precious lives have been lost besides damage of property of residents, which is very, very unfortunate. These accidents are a result of prevailing misunderstanding between two sections of our society. The state government is seized of the developments and taking all steps to control the law and order situation. The situation, though tense, is reported to be under control. Given the swift deployment of army to bring the rapidly escalating situation under control, one can only hope that normalcy returns soon to Manipur. Well, that's all the time we have in this edition of World at War. And if you want to reach out to me with any comments, feedback or suggestions, please feel free to do so on the Twitter handle that you see on your screens. I'm your host, Mohamed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week.